Our scripture lesson comes to us today from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Thus ends the reading. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that what might be heard now is your word, not mine. Hide me, Lord Jesus, behind the cross, that you might be seen and known. It's in the name of Jesus we listen and that we pray. Amen. I thought that today, as we lean towards Holy Week, would be a good time to look at one of the central figures that Scripture puts in front of us as the events of Holy Week unfold. One of the figures that has somewhat befuddled me over the years is the figure of Judas. And here's what it is that that confused me for years about him. Well, simply this, why did he do what he did? Why would it have been important for him to turn Jesus in? To start the ball rolling in the direction that it rolled? Why did he do what he did? Let me tell you what I used to think. Here's how I answered that question for years. I thought that Judas just became a bad guy that he decided he had had enough of Jesus, that he didn't believe in him anymore. He was over all of this Jesus stuff. And so at best that Jesus just be out of the way. That's what I used to think about Judas. I've come to have a different view of him. Please understand that that doesn't make my view right. I just thought I would share it with you today and invite you to take it for what it's worth. My old view of Judas, I believe, was very safe for me. My new view of Judas is far more dangerous to me. You'll understand why as we go on. To understand Judas, we have to get at the mindset of the world into which he was born and grew. And the mindset specifically regarding the Messiah and what the expectations of the Messiah were would be this. Judas was born into a world, raised in a world, moved through a world there in his Jewish area where his fellow Jews thought the Messiah would be a man of the sword. They expected, our Jewish brethren did back in that day, that when the Messiah showed up, that he would show up at Passover and would defeat all the enemies of Israel. The anticipation was that he would set up an earthly kingdom. The events that we just reenacted to begin this service where people were breaking off palm branches and shouting and creating this ad hoc parade shows us how deep that expectation of the Messiah was that he would come and set up an earthly kingdom. The crowd that greeted Jesus in Jerusalem that day that were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
we're thinking, here it comes. Boy, the enemies of Jerusalem, the enemies of Israel, they're going to get their comeuppance now. Because if Jesus is the Messiah, here he is showing up at Passover just as anticipated. And he's going to lead a revolt and all the enemies of God's people will be overthrown and they are going to look up to us now. Israel will be the center of it with Jerusalem being the capital of it all. The crowd waving the palm branches and shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was the expectation that they carried. Hence the parade that was so enthusiastic that the gospel tells us that all of the city of Jerusalem was stirred by it. That was their expectation. Here he comes. It starts now. We'll set up an earthly kingdom now. The festival of Passover The parade of palms happened at the beginning of Passover. The festival of Passover would go on for a number of days. One day passed, then two. No earthly kingdom seemed to be taking shape. No armed revolt, nothing that would rise up and make anything any different than it was before Passover even started. In fact, to the Jewish countrymen, the Romans who occupied that area, well, they were still there. The ones that were patrolling our streets before Passover started are still here now on day three of Passover. Do something, Jesus. Make this thing work. As the week wore on, Day by day, more and more, their expectation became frustration. Near the end of the week, Pilate stands before a crowd. He asks them, what should I do with Jesus? They had an answer for him. I don't know this for fact, but my strong suspicion is that many that were in this crowd that Pilate is addressing were also in the crowd waving palm branches earlier in the week. Oh, here it comes. It starts now. But now towards the end of the week when Pilate puts to them the question, Instead of waving palm branches, they're waving clenched fists. Their answer, crucify him. That's how strong the expectation was. That the Messiah would come and Make it all right. I share all that with you to give you a window into what I really think was Judas' mindset. To give you a window into what it was that led him to do what he did. He was caught up in the same expectation that the crowd had. That the Messiah would come and set up an earthly kingdom and it would all be well. The Passover week wore on and Judas was watching and Jesus wasn't making any move towards doing anything that Judas thought would make any difference in the balance of power in the world. The Romans were still there. Do something, Jesus, Judas thought. Here's the thing. I don't think that Judas stopped believing in Jesus I don't think that Judas wanted Jesus to die. I just believe his 
expectation of what Jesus would do was misplaced. He just knew Jesus would establish this earthly kingdom. He didn't get that Jesus came, at least for now, to establish a spiritual one. Judas confused his expectations of what the Jesus would do, of what the Messiah would do, with what it was that Jesus was really about. I think of Judas this, that he believed in his mind that if he could back Jesus into a corner, if he could, then he could force him to act. He could make him get on with the program of what Judas just knew Jesus was going to do, set up this earthly kingdom. He thought that if he could force Jesus' hand, he would start this rebellion He never thought it would end in the cross. If you think about it, that explains the grief that Judas felt after the fact, after Jesus died. If you read forward in the account of the scripture that Matthew offers us, we find Judas going back to the leaders and saying to them, let me give the money back. Let's take this thing back. As Jesus got closer to the cross, because Judas never thought it would get there. He thought surely Jesus would do something dramatic, not the cross. His expectations of what Jesus were about were misplaced. He confused his own expectations of what Jesus would do with what it was that Jesus was really about. So Judas goes to the high priest and using language that would bait them into doing what Judas wanted them to do to force Jesus' hand, he asked them, what will you give me if I betray him to you? Here's why I see this way of seeing Judas as being far more dangerous for me. I'm not going to say I'm done with Jesus. I'm over with him. It's best that Jesus is out of my life and out of my way. I'm not going to do that. If I see Judas that way, that's no challenge for me on Thursday of this week or Thursday of any other week. However, I might confuse my expectations of what Jesus is about with what Jesus really is about. That's the danger for me. That's the danger I face when I see Judas this way. Bart was raised believing that it was right to not like anybody that didn't look like him, that to not like anybody that wasn't from where he was from. He believed that he honored God with that kind of suspicion and to use the word of his t- testimony, hatred. God wanted him to think that way. That was what he thought. He was raised in an area that fostered that thinking in him. When his daughter was about 20, she was making a trip over here to Wilmington. They lived about 80, 90 miles away. It was a cold, nasty, rainy day in January. His daughter got on the, that marshy area that stretched between Leland And here, her car broke down. Being the day before cell phones, she had to rely on the mercy of whoever would stop to help her. There was no calling anybody. Some of you along with me remember the day before cell phones. 
Finally, someone stopped after about an hour of standing in the rain and the cold, flagging down cars, hoping for help from somebody, anybody. A couple stopped and put her, had no idea who she was, loaded them, her in their car, took them across the bridge in here into Wilmington and into their home, gave her something to eat and some dry clothing to wear while they washed and dried hers. She used their landline, anybody remember landlines? To call her parents, mom and dad, 80 miles away. Bart got in his car so thankful that somebody had stopped to help his daughter in these dire circumstances. He drives over, finds the address that they had given him. The door is open and there stands the lady of the house. Whose face looked very much unlike his own. He's quickly introduced to the man of the house who too, whose face looked very much unlike his. As he tells the story, God did something in him in that moment. His life turned around 180 degrees in that moment. He realized, I have been wrong. What I thought I was doing, the direction my life is going, the way I thought I was honoring God in this area of my life had been wrong all along. He said, I came to understand that Jesus was for everybody. As I lean into this Holy Week, I think I'm going to ask myself a question. I'm trying hard to serve Jesus. Really, I, I, really, I am. But are there some held practices that I have become accustomed to in my own life? Are there some attitudes and views of things that I hold to? that I think God blesses, that I think Jesus honors, that maybe I need to lay down. Let's pray together. Lord, as we start this Holy Week, there's an image in my head of you and 12 others sitting around a table and you breaking the polite dinner conversation by offering a hard comment, one of you will betray me. And I hear at least 11 of the disciples respond by saying, Lord, is it me? I'd love to add my voice to the 11, Lord. Is it I? I must admit, in my instance, sometimes it is. Lord, show me where I need to turn more fully towards you. It is in the name of Jesus who died for us, who died for all, that we seek to follow, that we pray. And all God's people together said, Amen. Amen.
Today's benediction is responsive. It is printed in your bulletin. Will you stand as you join me in that? We are going on a journey. Let us go forward where Christ walks, where Christ stumbles. Where Christ cries, we will listen. when Christ suffers, we will when Christ dies, we will our heads in sorrow. come, let us go forward.